CME activities and rules and regs have changed. Again, happy new year. <laughs> um, today's presentation by Monica Sanchez Avila will be in search of nodular gastric antral vascular ectasia, GAVE, a distinct entity or simply hyperplastic polyps arising in GAVE. The text act or the activity attendance code for today is 1307. This code can no longer be shared on chat um, for new CME rules. So I will put it up at the beginning and the end of the presentations. Um, I'd ask you do have a reminder, 24 hours to put this code into the system in order to receive credit. Um, I, trainees, I am um, taking, keeping track of attendance, so I apologize for making that um, remark yesterday. Okay, Monica, if you want to go in and share your screen, okay, we're just, ready to go. Monica has been with us as a resident and is now a fellow in AP. Um, she is the first of our trainees to present this year in what will be the next couple of months. Trainee presentations, those who will be leaving us, we don't want her to leave, but she will be headed to NYU next year. Thank you for um, having me today. Uh, and thanks for that introduction. Recording in progress. And thanks for that intro, Amy. So today, um, as uh, Amy mentioned, I'm the Surgical Pathology Fellow. And today I will be presenting In Search of Nodular Gave, a distinct entity or simply hyperplastic polyps arising in Gave. And I do not have any conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, within the next hour, we will discuss a number of topics related to gastric antral vascular ectasia, includes including a recently described novel phenotype, as well as gastric hyperplastic polyps for reasons I hope will be clear by the end of this talk. Sorry, Thanks. Monica, uh, are you sharing your screen? Thanks, Dr. Kalika, sorry. Um, as I was saying, we will cover a number of topics. Um, and after that, I will move on to discussing a study we did to determine if nodular gave and gastric hyperplastic polyps are in fact distinct entities. And of course, at the end, I will leave time for questions. So gastric antral vas vascular ectasia, or in short, gave, is an acquired vascular abnormality of the stomach of unknown pathogenesis. Several hypotheses attribute it to mechanical stress that induces prolapse secondary to strong gastric peristalsis. Other hypotheses point to local activation of vasoactive substances, and some li literature even suggests it could be a form of an autoimmune phenomenon. GAVE occurs most commonly in the antrum, hence the name antral vascular ectasia. However, following the initial uh, description, several studies published these findings to also occur in the cardia, small intestine, and rectum. GAVE may be a cause of upper GI bleeding, and is responsible for up to 4% of non variceal upper GA hemorrhages. And the diagnosis is made by identifying the pathognomonic endoscopic changes initially described by Jabari and his colleagues in 1984. This Canadian group initially identified these erythematous red stripes, which are originating radially from the pylorus and extending into the antrum. They thought it resembled a watermelon and therefore coined the term watermelon stomach. Additional studies later on identified a punctate pattern where instead of stripes, it has a petechial appearance. And these petechiae or spots also originally originate in the pylorus and extend onto the antrum. Up to 30% of patients with GAVE also have cirrhosis and up to 60% of them has have an associated autoimmune disorder. An important differential diagnosis will be portal hypertensive gastropathy, which will endoscopically also have red spots in the mucosa and also occurs in cirrhotic patients. However, up to 90% of gay patients do not have portal hypertension and even those that also have cirrhosis. Um, there are a couple of treatment options. Endoscopy with argon plasma coagulation is the first line therapy, and alternatives to this can be with band ligation and cryotherapy. 
Um, whereas a surgical approach with entrectomy is a definitive treatment. Um, however, this approach has a high morbidity, even more so in patients with other comorbidities and gay patients are usually elderly. More conservative approaches have been tried with hormone therapy, specifically with estrogen and octreotide. However, these have given marginal and mixed results. Moving on to morphology, class of gave uh, histology includes vascular ectasia, along with regenerative and inflammatory mucosal changes, such as spinal cell proliferation of the lamina propria, intervascular fibrin thrombi, and fibrohyalinosis. And these images taken from Selinger, um, Selinger's paper, we can see onto the left, this prominent vascular ectasia. In the middle, we can see um, some fulvular hyperplasia, again, some vascular ectasia, and some wisps of smooth muscle proliferation. And on to the right, we can see um, fulvular hyperplasia again, and an intravascular thrombus. Several scoring systems have been developed over the years to determine the presence of GAVE according to histological features. Initially, the Gilliam score published in 1989 was created to distinguish GAVE from chronic and atrophic gastritis on endoscopic biopsy. Back then, they used to routinely perform entrectomy for both diagnosis and management in all of the GAVE patients. Their scoring system was based on the presence or absence of three features, fibrin thrombi, vasperctasia, and spinal cell proliferation. Um, the scoring system they devised was if fibrin thrombi uh, um, and vasperctasia was either both absent, uh, if they were both absent, they would get a zero. If one was present, they would get one. And if both present, they would get a two. Spinal cell uh, proliferation would get zero for absent, and then it was graded as either increased or markedly increased. A score of equal or higher to three out of four would um, show a positive predictive value of 100, um, negative predictive value of 100, and high sensitivity and specificity. Um, and this was when facing the dilemma of diagnosing GAVE compared to chronic or atrophic gastritis. In, later on in 1995, however, Jean-Louis Bayen and his French group questioned the differential diagnosis of portal hyper, hypertensive gastropathy with GAVE and the applicability of this Gilliam score in differentiating the two. They added, therefore, fibrohyalinosis to the original Gilliam score, which was graded as either absent or present. They call this new system the GAVE scoring system, and this allowed for an accurate distinction of where 71% of GAVE cases uh, would have a score greater or higher than three, while only 7% uh, of portal hypertensive gastropathy would have this uh, high score. Most recently in 2012, a gastroenterology group from the University of South Carolina described a novel phenotype of GAVE termed modular GAVE, following a case series of three patients with iron-deficiency anemia, which also had antral nodules on upper endoscopy. These are the endoscopic and histologic images from their article. And in the upper panels, we can see these nodular appearance on endoscopy um, arising in a background of GAVE. And in the lower inserts, we can appreciate the histology for each case. In insert D, um, they are highlighting vast rectasia. In the middle insert, they are pointing out to uh, fulvular hyperplasia. And to the right, they are demonstrating a fibrin thrombus. At the time of publishing, they claimed these features as diagnostic of a novel phen phenotype of GAVE, which would now on be termed nodular GAVE. A second study by this same group aimed to compare the clinical and histological characteristics of distinct GAVE phenotypes, including the stripe and punctate forms with their newly described nodular phenotype. They studied a total of 136 patients, of which 46% belong to the stripe category, 24% to the punctate, and 30% in the nodular category. They found all forms of GAVE to occur most frequently in men, um, different to previous studies, which had all reported to occur more frequently in women. The average age of, of the patients was 61 years, 
and the most common clinical indication for endoscopy among all three groups was variceal screening. This is a picture of the histology provided in the article as an example of the non-jerky phenotype. They highlight mucosal inflammation, ovular hyperplasia, um, some areas of vascular ectasia, and a fibrin thrombus um, and within this polypoid structure. Histologic comparison between the three gay phenotypes showed that reactive epithelial hyperplasia and vascular ectasia were universally present among the three groups. And all the other histological features of smooth muscle proliferation, fibrin thrombi, and fibrohyalinosis were present in different proportions through all gay types with really no statistically significant difference between the three. I do wanna point out how prevalent was the smooth muscle proliferation, which was a, a, a consistent feature found in above, almost above 80% in all the three groups. However, meanwhile, the fibrin thrombi and the fibrohyalinosis were, um, were present in all forms of gait, but it was to a much lesser frequency. And also I wanna point out that even the nodular morphology by the pathologist was really only accurate uh, correctly identified in 25% of nodular gave cases, and it was incorrectly suggested in some of the punctate and the, and the stripe forms. So this paper was really mainly a descriptive study, and there are important limitations that do need to be highlighted. One is the lack of a definition of the minimal diagnostic criteria for nodular gave. Two is the absence of a discussion of polyps in the stomach outside the context of gave. And finally, there was really no provision of a differential diagnosis for nodular gave. So let us dedicate a moment to look into the differential diagnosis of the most common polyps in the stomach. Gastric polyps in general are detected in um, one to 6% of upper endoscopies. In this diagram, uh, which is based on the largest epidemiological study of prevalence of gastric polyps, which was done by Dr. Gentis group in Texas, and included over 700,000 patients, showed the most common type of stomach polyps are by far fundic gland polyps, followed by gastric hyperplastic polyps, and to a much lesser extent, gastric adenomas and neuroendocrine tumors. 20 years ago, hyperplastic polyps used to be the most common type. However, after several recent studies showed that they are now the second most common type, and this shift is believed to occur secondary to two major factors. First is the widespread and long-term use of proton pump inhibitors in patients with dyspepsia, when, and this in turn has led to the development of fundic gland polyps in oxyntic mucosa. And two is the decline of H. pylori gastritis and its sequela of gastric atrophy and intestinal metaplasia, which are commonly associated with hyperplastic polyps. And out of these four most common gastric polyps, the one that really truly represents a major differential diagnosis of nodular gave will be gastric hyperplastic polyps due to their location, frequency, age at presentation, and histology. So um, just as mentioned, these are the most uh, second, the second most common type. They are gonna occur more commonly in the antrum, although they can occur anywhere in the stomach, including the body, fundus, cardiac, and G junction. They arise most frequently in women among the 65 to 75 age group, and they can largely be found incidentally, but over 50% of them present with anemia and upper GI bleeding. Most uh, occur as a single lesion, but they can also present as multiple polyps. And as with other gastric polyps, their presence is significantly associated with other polyp types, including fundin gland polyps due to the con concomitant use of proton pump inhibitors, as well as gastric adenomas and neuroendocrine tumors, and uh, because of their association with atro atrophic gastritis. Um, these hyperplastic polyps can occur sporadically as, or as a component of polyposis syndrome. And the majority of polyps are gonna be over 0.5 centimeters with about a third are over one centimeter. The largest one reported to date has been nine centimeters 
And this particular one was located in the antrum and caused gastric outlet obstruction syndrome. In this picture, we can see the typical endoscopic appearance of multiple hyperplastic polyps in a patient without GAVE. So what is the pathogenesis behind this polyps? Their exact mechanism has not been entirely elucidated, but they believe to arise as an excessive proliferation of volvular epithelium, almost as an exuberant regenerative phenomenon of mucosal injury. This is why at some point they were even referred to as regenerative polyps. The arising mucosa with chronic or atrophic astritis, which is commonly due to H. pylori infection, although really any type of mucosal injury can lead to their development. Hyperplastic polyps may undergo neoplastic and malignant transformation, although it is rare and occurs in less than 2% of cases. And several studies have shown that when these polyps do undergo neoplastic and malignant transformation, there is a positive correlation with their size. The histology of, of these polyps, therefore, as very well expected, will be that of marked regenerative changes, both in the epithelium and the stroma component, including hyperplastic fluvular epithelium, spinal cell proliferation of both smooth, smooth muscle and myofibroblast, there will be stromal edema and a mixed inflammatory cell infiltrate composed of plasma cells, lymphocytes, EOs, macrophages, and neutrophils. Um, in up to 30% of cases, there can be foci of intestinal metaplasia and vascular ectasia and occasional uh, fibrin thrombi have also been described. In these photographs of a hyperplastic polyp taken from Jane's paper, we see the characteristic polypoid architecture in these uh, torches dilated glands. And in this other picture, we see these very prominent and uh, elongated hyperplastic volvular epithelium, which are very characteristic. And this other case is showing, again, the volvular hyperplasia, dilated torturous uh, antral glands, and we can see this proliferation of smooth muscle and splaying of the muscularis mucosa. In this high magnification of another case, we see some areas of vascular ectasia and even a fibrin thrombus. So, so far we have reviewed the characteristics of GAVE, nodular GAVE, and gastric hyperplastic polyps. Um, so to wrap up, let's compare the histological similarities and differences between nodular GAVE and hyperplastic polyps before we move on to the next part of the talk. As noted in this table, both nodular GAVE and, and uh, these hyperplastic polyps uh, have alveolar hyperplasia, spinal cell proliferation, vascular ectasia, uh, fibrin thrombi is found commonly in nodular GAVE. However, it has also been reported in hyperplastic polyps and fibrohyalinosis, uh, which has been reported in nodular GAVE, uh, but we just do not know the occurrence in hyperplastic polyps. So you might find yourself asking if nodular GAVE really is a distinct entity as, des as described by Thomas et al. Um, and his group, or is it simply a gastric hyperplastic polyp arising in patients with GAVE? And this is precisely what led to our research project when at some point Dr. Mallory asked the GI pathologists of our department if the polyps they were diagnosing as hyperplastic polyps weren't in fact nodular gate. And so we decided to investigate this. So appropriately, the title of our study is In Search of Nodular Gave, a distinct entity or simply hyperplastic polyps arising in gave. This was a collaboration study between the Department of Gastroenterology, including Dr. Gang and Dr. Mallory, and Dr. Mallory, sorry, and our pathology department, including Dr. Asta Chohan, Dr. Amin, um, and myself, uh, with Dr. Snover as our senior author. Um, our objectives were to determine the incidence of features reported as characteristic of nodular GAVE in gastric hyperplastic polyps with or without GAVE to determine if nodular GAVE and hyperplastic polyps are in fact distinct ent um, entities. And during the course of reviewing um, slides for this study, additional features were noted that were of potential interest. And we also recorded and analyzed these. 
Um, these included polyp size, gland type, extent of vascular ectasia, ulceration, and granulation tissue. Um, so we conducted a retrospective natural language search within our UMN pathology system, COPATH. Uh, we queried the term hyperplastic polyp and stomach over a five-year period from January 2013 to December 2017. Um, data on polyp size and location, as well as the presence or absence of GABE, was determined by reviewing the endoscopy reports and endoscopy photographs. Um, this latter was done by a gastroenterologist. In this case, it was uh, specifically Dr. Mallory. Clinical data, including demographics, were retrieved from the electronic medical record. H&E slides were blindly reviewed and semi-quantitatively analyzed for a number of histologic features, uh, which will all be detailed in the next slides. And this analysis was performed by a gastrointestinal pathologist, specifically Dr. Snover, who was unaware of the polyp site, endoscopic findings, and clinical information. Scoring was performed by examining all the tissue on the slide, and if there were multiple levels, only the most complete level was analyzed. Cases were excluded, however, if they were either too small and superficial to evaluate, or if the underlying diagnosis of hyperplastic polyps was incorrect. Um, for statistical analysis, um, this was done by comparing the GABE and the non-GABE groups using Fisher's XAP test for um, categorical var variables and the Man Whitney U test for continuous variables. And this data analysis was done per, um, using uh, the software Stata. This table illustrates the semi quantitative scoring system we used to evaluate each polyp. And we will now go over each of these categories. Um, to start off, uh, alveolar hypoplasia was graded based on an estimate of the length of the foveoli as being either less or greater than 25% of the thickness of the polyp, uh, grade one and grade two respectively. So here on the left, we have an example of a grade one where uh, it is less than 25% of the polyp thickness and to the right, an example of it being more than 25% of the polyp thickness. The degree of vascular ectasia was graded as one if it was present only ovally, as this picture here on the left, um, and two if it was widespread but did not expand the lamina propria, and three if it was widespread and expanded the lamina propria. Intravascular fibrin thrombi were graded as uh, being absent or present in the superficial uh, capillaries. And as we see here, some fibrin thrombi in both of these pictures. The degree of spindle cell proliferation was graded based on being either easily visible as scattered bundles um, at high power or which equated for us as a 200X only versus extensive spindling visible at a low power, uh, which we set at 40X. Fibrohalinosis, which was initially described by Jean-Louis Bayen in 1995 in his French group. Um, at that time, they defined fibrohalinosis as this homogeneous substance, which is uh, light pink on h &E, and occurs um, around the ectatic capillaries of the lamina propria. Um, Interestingly, several other studies have tried to um, uh, sort out if this is amyloid and um, turns out on EM and on Congo red, it is not amyloid. Um, so we use the same definition as the French group and graded it as being visible at high power only versus low power. And finally, ulceration was graded based on being uh, focally present as in the image here on the left versus being focally, um, sorry, being extensive um, as here on the right. And granulation tissue was graded as either being present or absent. So now let's move on to our results. <clears throat> Out of a total of 103 polyps that were initially reviewed, 13 were eliminated for technical and or diagnostic reasons. Either there was insufficient tissue for evaluation or the initial diagnosis was incorrect. 
um, giving us a final cohort of 90 polyps. Of these uh, 90 polyps, the majority were female patients and GAVE was present in 20% of our cases, which equated for us to 18 cases. The majority of GAVE cases occurred in males versus non-GAVE cases, which occur less common in males. This finding is comparable to the Thomas paper where they also found GAVE cases to occur most commonly in men. And it is also in agreement with other literature that reports that hyperplastic polyps are more common in women. We found this difference of gender to be statistically significant. The median age of patients presenting with GAVE was 59 years versus 61 years in non-GAVE cases. In terms of location of these polyps within the stomach, um, the antrum was a primary site for both GAVE and non-GAVE cases followed by the body, um, we did have six non-GAVE cases in the cardia and GE junction and five within the fundus. However, no cases of GAVE were found in either of these two locations. The average size of GAVE polyps was 1.3 centimeters um, with a range from 0.5 to 3 centimeters. Um, and meanwhile, the non-GAVE polyps had an average size of 0.6 centimeters from a range of 0.2 to 1.6. And we also found this difference to be statistically significant. Both GAVE and non-GAVE cases had foveolar hyperplasia in all of their cases. Um, spindle, uh, spindle cell proliferation was present significantly in both GAVE and non-GAVE cases. In GAVE cases, however, it was slightly more commonly visible at low power for that uh, uh, 40X, sorry, uh, yes. Um, and these differences were not statistically significant. Our findings were similar to what Thomas et al. reported in nodular GAVE cases, where they found 78% of spinal cell proliferation. And our study is just a little slightly higher at 83%. GAVE cases were more frequently associated with vascular ectasia than non-GAVE cases, particularly moderate to marked ectasia with a greater expansion of the lamina propria. These differences, again, were statistically significant, and our findings do contrast, do contrast to those of the Thomas group, which found vascular ectasia in 100% of all forms of GAVE. So we had a slightly less percentage than they did. Fibrin thrombi were, were present in 50% of GAVE cases, while present in only 14% of the non-GAVE cases. This difference also was statistically significant. And um, interestingly, our percentage of cases of fibrin thrombi is exactly the, the same as uh, not only as the Thomas study, but also as other literature where they consistently find fibrin thrombi in 50% of the cases. Um, and I just thought this was interesting. Uh, meanwhile, fibrohyalinosis was a most uh, more frequent finding in GAVE cases in almost exact inverse proportions. Again, this was a significant finding among the groups. And when comparing our findings with the Thomas paper, we found a higher percentage of fibrohyalinosis. They have reported in their um, study a 53% of, of it present in nodular GAVE, and we have it higher at 72%. Ulceration was more common in GAVE cases. And when we analyze the degree of ulceration as either it being focal versus extensive, extensive ulceration was a particular feature of GAVE. And again, this difference uh, turned out to be statistically significant. Um, and granulation tissue had the same results. So as seen, um, our results, there was really no features or a combination of features that were exclusively found in either GAVE or non-GAVE polyps. Foveolar hyperplasia and spindle cell proliferation was nearly universally present in both polyp types with no statistically significance between the groups. Um, antral type glands were the most predominant type in both groups. Um, and this is typical of hyperplastic polyps, especially given the antral location of most of them. 
in patients with GABE, moderate to marked vascular ectasia, fibrin thrombi, and fibrohyalinosis were statistically uh, more common than in non-GABE polyps. And this finding most likely represents superimposition of background GABE onto hyperplastic polyps arising in GABE. Um, also, polyps in GABE are larger and more commonly ulcerated than non-GABE polyps. Um, but so what do these findings mean for diagnosis and what are their predictive value? We calculated the sensitivity, specificity, and predictive values of several histologic features that showed a statistically significant difference among the groups and that were previously reported to occur in GAVE. As we can observe, the absence of any of these features has a strong negative predictive value for GAVE. However, the positive predictive value is in general low. As such, the absence of these features are more indicative of a non-GAVE background than their presence is in establishing a GAVE diagnosis. Interestingly, um, for us, ulceration was, um, was the feature with the highest specificity. And this uh, really was surprising to us as ulceration is in general uh, not considered to be a very specific finding. So really out of fun and curiosity, we started to analyze what would happen if we combine these histologic features. Could they somehow improve the diagnostic significance? Um, and we can see here that most combinations really did not have a big effect. However, in the most extreme case, a polyp with all the four features um, does reach a relatively high positive predictive value of 83%, but um, when doing so, the negative predictive value drops and the sensitivity falls to 28%. Therefore, while a combination of all the features indicates a high likelihood, sorry, a high likelihood of GABE, the absence of these features really does not rule it out. And then, of course, we do have the problem that as you start combining features, the number of cases starts getting very small. Um, so now let's go back to that ulceration, which I had mentioned was the most specific feature favoring nodular GABE. Um, obviously, we went ahead uh, looking for an explanation of this. Um, could it be related to size? Polyps arising in GAVE are on average larger than those in non-GAVE, and this difference was even statistically uh, significant. Maybe greater size has some sort of mechanical effect on the polyp. So to test our hypothesis, we analyze size alone as a predictor of ulceration by comparing the size of all ulcerated polyps with and without GABE to all no non-ulcerated polyps. And as you can see here, um, the average size difference was one centimeter versus 0 .8, 0 0.8 centimeter. So really this size difference is negligible. Um, so this leads us to believe that there might be some other process intrinsic to GABE, such as vascular thrombosis, that leads to chronic ischemic injury. Um, this theory could, in point, uh, in fact, explain that ulceration and also provide a reason behind why um, these polyps are, can recur if the underlying GABE is not treated. So in summary, um, we believe that these so-called nodular GABE really does represent hyperplastic polyps arising secondary to mucosal injury caused by GABE and is not a specific unique entity. Um, there were no features which allowed a definitive, uh, or sorry, either no hostologic features or the combination of them allowed for a definitive diagnosis of GABE in gastric hyperplastic polyps. Um, however, the presence of any of the histological features uh, of moderate to severe vascular ectasia with or without fibroid thrombi, fibrohyalinosis, or ulcerations suggests possibly underlying GAPE when diagnosing a hyperplastic polyp. Um, however, their absence does not rule out underlying GAPE. And finally, I do want to take a couple of minutes to acknowledge those who have taught me and who I've um, had the pleasure to work with as a resident and now as a fellow. So that would mainly include um, 
people from all our departments, but of course, being a surgical pathology and an AP only resident includes mainly the AP department. And of course, I wouldn't be where I am today without the wonderful support and friendship of all the residents and fellows I've met during my four years of training at the U. Pathology really is such a small world. And I am excited to see where we all end up in five, 10, 20 years from now. Truly, I do wish everyone the best of luck. And last but not least, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to my friend and mentor, Dr. Snover. He has played a pivotal role during my training, this research study, and even this presentation. I am very fortunate to have such a mentor early on in my career, um, especially one who shares his passion for pathology, his wisdom of life, and his friendship. Um, Dr. Snover, truly your encouragement and guidance has meant everything to me and I can only hope to make you proud. And uh, with that, this concludes my presentation. Thank you all for tuning in today, and I am open to any questions. Thank you, Monica, job well done. Any questions from the audience? Uh, Monica, this is uh, John Crossman. A uh, very interesting presentation. I had not heard of Gabe before this morning, so I appreciate it. You, you, yeah, you mentioned early on that some yeah. investigators think this may be uh, an autoimmune disease, and I recognize that you said I think there were uh, sixty percent of these patients uh, in the literature t tend to have an autoimmune phenotype, but. What else about Gabe would suggest that it's an autoimmune disease besides that uh, relationship between the uh, autoimmunity and the background of these patients? Uh, thanks, Dr. Crossan. Yeah, so I think it has really uh, been made more of an association. Um, they predominantly find these patients in, um, sorry, this Gabe entity within scleroderma patients. Um, so that has led them to believe, could it be part of the scleroderma of, or mm. other crest syndromes? Um, then, of course, there has also been literature saying um, that there are positive um, autoimmune antibodies. Of course, if they just measure, measure ANAs, which are very ubiquitously um, among the population, that really doesn't say much. So I think it's more related to the scleroderma and crest patients um, and really? with yeah. uh, Raynaud's phenomenon. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Yes, of course. And I'm surprised I finished early. Well, not really surprised when I practiced this, it took a little longer, but of course the day of you um, speak a little faster. <laughs> That's okay. Anyone else this morning have questions for Monica? Okay, Monica, if you wanna unshare your screen, oh, sorry. Yep. go back to showing my... Did I stop? Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna put mine on. New CME requirements um, require that we no longer share attendance codes on the chat format. So look for this at this slide at the beginning and end of all of the grand rounds coming up. As I said earlier, we have two months of trainee presentations of our PGY4s or our fellows that were at the university in the residency program last year. Um, and interspersed in that will be Dr. Jesse Siegmiller. And then we do have the diversity, equity, um, DEI speaker um, later in January. Um, so please pay attention. I will also send out this information via email to all the faculty. Um, another change is that um, faculty or staff hosts are required for grand rounds. They must be University of Minnesota um, faculty and staff to have this job. Um, anybody who is joining us as a guest, of course, is always um, Always welcome to join us in any chat or live Q&A sessions. Okay, 
for today. That is all. Next week, we have QA with Dr. Claudia Cohn. Um, so that'll be our nine o'clock. After eight o'clock, invitations will be sent for both. Here, Yusuf will be our presenter that day.